All right, our topic is units, dimensions, and homogeneity, oh my, kind of like lions, tigers, and bears, oh my. In particular, we're interested in units, dimensions, and the differences between them. Now, units are very important in this course, and I had a student at one time on an exam that didn't know what they were doing with the test. They didn't understand the concepts, and it was some problem where I asked them to calculate something called boundary work. And they probably thought to themselves, okay, work. What is work? Well, from physics class, work is force times distance. Okay, great. So they wrote down work, as you see in the equation there, work equals F times S. So force applied through a distance. Okay, great. Now, the student should have realized that the units of this would come out as energy. Kilojoules, BTU, something like that. So the, the units, uh, or the, the dimension, excuse me, would be energy, and the units would be kilojoules, BTUs, foot pounds, force, something like that. Um, and that's, that should have helped them along their way. Now, in the problem, I had given a pressure and I gave a, a volume or a distance. I don't remember right now. Probably a distance or something. And so the student thought, okay, well, there's a pressure. Oh, that's force. And they threw it in. It's 150 kilopascals. And the distance, there were two distances given, as I recall. And so they just took the difference between those two distances to get the distance traveled. Well, here's the problem. Pressure and force are two different things. Pressure is a force applied over an area, right? It's the amount of force per unit area, whether that be a, a square inch or a square foot or square meter, whatever you want. It's a force per area, and the student didn't seem to understand that. It's critical that you know that. It's also important that you understand what's going on in the course and understand that most of the time we're not dealing with that. In fact, the pressure should have... Um, made him think of the boundary work equation, which you see down there uh, in the bottom of the slide. Boundary work is integral with PDV. And there are various forms of it. We'll come across that a little bit later in the course. But the particular equation the student should have used is one like you see down there at the bottom of the uh, slide that involves pressure and volume. And he's supposed to calculate the volume from the, the length dimensions that I had given. Well, now, going back up to what the student actually used, you'll notice that kilopascals times meters, well, what is a kilopascal? Well, a kilopascal is a kilonewton per square meter, right? Okay, so it's thousands of newtons per square meter, or thousands of pascals. Well, if we multiply by meters, one of the meters in the denominator, that meter squared, that area is going to cancel, and the units would be kilonewtons per meter, rather than energy. And so the units actually are there to help you. They, they will save you. There are many times I've been working example problems for students or working homework solutions, and I ended up with the wrong units, and I thought, oh, I, I know I've made a mistake somewhere because there's no way the units should come out that way. And, and it's helped me. I've been able to go back, find my mistakes, and correct them. So you can't uh, mash apples and oranges together. You can't just mash two things together and, and um, come out with something that's reasonable or makes sense. In fact, units and dimensions can be used for helping you solve problems. So here's a track, and normally I would cover up the location of this track and ask students if they know where it's at. It's the Indianapolis racetrack. The uh, oval is, well, you can see part of the oval there in the track. This is the F1 course at the Indy 500. And the question is, how many hours will it take for a race? If we know that a race consists of so many laps that the distance for uh, one, you know, one loop around this circuit uh, is known there. Uh, 2.607 meters, for example. That can't be right. 2.607 meters, 4. Point, oh, miles, of course, sorry. I'm used to seeing MI for miles and M for meters. Yeah, because 4.195 kilometers, that would make some sense. 73 laps for a total race, and then a total distance of 306.235 kilometers or 190.326 miles. Well, my question is, this is great. How many hours is it going to take for me to sit here and watch this race? Well, we can't know it yet. We need to know an approximate or average speed of the cars. So let's, let's assume one, and from that data, we should be able to calculate uh, the amount of time we're going to be sitting watching a race. Now, this is the sort of thing that probably confused you a lot back in algebra when you were in high school. Um, I wish that in high school they would teach units because units actually work just like fractions and numbers. They're, they're the same thing, really. Um, and once you get that, it's very easy to work with them. So all I'm going to do is take the numbers we have and put them together to get out what I want. Let me show you by example. So we got 2.607 miles per lap 
times 73 laps per race divided by 205, 205 miles per hour. We'll assume that that's the average speed of the race car. Well, why did I choose this? Well, let me show you. Uh, the way that the units cancel will give me what I want. So I knew how I wanted to organize these things, which belonged in the numerator and denominator, based on the units. So watch what happens. So to the right there, we have uh, laps canceling. Why? Well, remember, when you have a fraction with 2 over 2, you can cancel them, right? In the same way, the laps and lap cancel one another. So units can cancel each other quite nicely. That leaves us with miles per race in the numerator. Now notice one very important thing here. I did not combine the numbers yet. I highly recommend when you are solving problems, whether it be a homework or exam or anything, I highly recommend that you work with the units first to make sure that all these numbers you're going to plug into your calculator, because some of the equations are pretty long, to make sure the result you get is what you want. So let's continue working with the units first. Now you'll notice we're on the second line. We've got miles per race in the numerator and miles per hour in the denominator. Now the, as I said, the units are just like fractions. So that miles per hour works just like a fraction. So we can invert and multiply that fraction just as if you had a, say, a one half over one fifth and you were trying to simplify it. You would invert the one fifth and multiply by the one half coming up with five halves, right? So let's invert the miles per hour and put it in the numerator so that it is now hours per mile. So we've got miles per race multiplied by hours per mile. Now if we cancel the miles, you notice we have one mile, uh, mile or miles in the numerator and one in the denominator that cancel nicely and we have hours per race. And so now we see that we've put the numbers in the right place as far as numerator and denominator goes. And now we're sure that we will get how many hours one race will take. So now let's take all of these um, numbers, plug them into our calculator, and you get almost an hour for one race. So um, hopefully this encourages you to use units, and you have to anyway. You're not going to get very far in this course, or very far as an engineer, without units. You do have to be careful with them, though, because you can't always derive a formula based simply on the units. So, for example, let's say we wanted the area of a circle. Well, you might know that the units of area are, are square feet, for example, or the dimension uh, of area is square length. And so you might say, well, let's see, the units, and you see my first equation there, area equals, and I've got a u there above the brackets, that just means the units of. Area has units of square feet, for example. Okay, great. But the area of a circle is not the diameter squared, right? That wouldn't work. On my second equation, that's not the way you calculate the area of a circle. The length squared is the way you calculate the area of a square, right? If you take diameter and square it. So you can see the, the dashed area that I'm actually calculating by the diameter squared. The area of the circle is pi over 4 times d squared. It's a, a scaling factor, right? That's what that pi over 4 is to take us from the area of the square to the area of a circle, which is what we wanted in the first place. So be really careful when you're trying to derive an equation using just the units of the things you're given. It doesn't always work. Now another thing to be careful of, if you have a, a problem where you're trying to take the natural logarithm of a number, if that number has units, you're probably doing something wrong. Or if you try to take a number like 10 to the third power and it's 3 pounds force as the power, Again, you're doing something wrong. Exponents and arguments of logarithmic functions should not have units in them. So this doesn't make any sense. So let's clarify the difference between dimensions and units. You may know, but a dimension is something that just is without us measuring it. So for example, mass, length, time, temperature, force, these are all dimensions. Now you probably think of dimensions as just three directions, but time is a dimension as well. Um, it's just, it's not a dimension where, you know, you can walk through time. Well, technically, we, we do kind of go through time, don't we, right? Time just advances as we go. The interesting thing, of course, is that time goes, what, slower if you're going really fast? You know, uh, kind of an interesting thing. Of course, most of the time we don't go fast enough for that to make any difference to us. But um, anyway, so dimensions are just natural things that can be measured, uh, whereas units are are the amounts of those dimensions that we apply so that we can all have a common language and common um, agreed upon amounts of things. So common units, say for mass or kilograms or pounds mass, that's another unit we will use in this class. Length, you got feet, you got meters. Uh, time, minutes, seconds, hours, um, is a light year time. 
Think about that for a second. Is a light year time? What does it mean? Well, a light year is actually how far light goes in a year, right? So a light year is not time. A light year is a measure of length, right? Angstroms are a measure of length. And I've just gone from one very small uh, order to an extremely large order by going between those two, right? Angstroms are extremely small amounts of length, whereas light years are very large amounts of length, at least relative to us human beings. Temperature, we've got, of course, many different ways of measuring temperature, and we're going to talk about temperature measurements a little bit more because there's a couple of wrinkles in that one. But, of course, degrees Fahrenheit, degrees Celsius, you're probably familiar with both. Uh, force, pounds force, newtons, these are all units of force. And there are other dimensions like pressure, for example, that uh, I haven't listed here. And plenty of other dimensions and units to talk about, but this will suffice for now. Now, we can differentiate between different types of dimensions and units, uh, primarily dimensions, based on whether they are so-called primary dimensions or secondary dimensions. And so primary dimensions are dimensions that can't be expressed in other dimensions more simply. So, for example, mass is a primary dimension, length, time, temperature, these are all primary. But force is actually a secondary dimension. Force can be expressed in other units besides, uh, say, pounds force, for example. And this shouldn't be all that much of a surprise to you. So let's consider why force is a secondary dimension. Well, you probably know that force is equal to mass times acceleration. Either you've had dynamics with me or you've taken a physics class and you know that force, F equals MA, right? One of Newton's laws. Well, if you stop and think about it for a second, acceleration itself is a secondary dimension as well, right? Because it's length per time squared, right? So you might have acceleration in feet per second squared or... Uh, meters per second squared, but acceleration is a secondary dimension, and by the way, you can write force in terms of mass and acceleration. In the SI units, for example, a newton is a kilogram times a meter per second squared. Now, in English, we have this thing called G sub C that is probably the bane of everyone's uh, existence, and it's probably the first point where someone who loves English units and comes into a class like this and sees this thing and gets confused about how to use it and uh, decides they hate English units. I am not a pro-metric or pro-English guy. I'm actually glad that here in the United States we use both, not because of the problems it causes, because it does cause significant problems, but I'm glad about it because it actually makes you think a little bit deeper. I don't want you to just think about the units you're using. I want you to think about the dimension and how dimensions relate to one another. And I really think that having to learn kind of two languages of dimensions helps in that, that matter. So let me give you a help, a little bit of help around the, uh, the symbol G sub C, which you've always, you've probably all hated, uh, or at least decide, well, I know how to use it, so I'm not going to worry about it. Bef I don't know if you guys remember the artist named Prince, but Prince changed his name to question mark. And along the way, of course, people would refer to him as the, you know, they'd write question mark and then parentheses, the artist formerly named are known as Prince. Well, I want you to think about G sub C, not in terms of G sub C, but as a conversion factor. Okay, so I want you to think of it as the conversion factor formerly known as G sub C. You don't really have to remember G sub C. Let me show you a nice little trick. Okay, look at my bottom equation on the slide. What you'll notice is I've got one pounds force equals 32.2 pounds mass feet per second squared. And I'll guarantee that's correct. If you go and you figure out if, if that's actually right or not from G sub C above, uh, you'll realize that it is correct. And what is this doing? Well, all it's really doing is giving you uh, a relationship between two force dimensions. These are two different force dimensions, okay, or different, I shouldn't say that. Force is one dimension. These are two units, two different units of the dimension of force, okay? So one pound force so one unit of pounds force is the same thing as 32.2 units of pound mass foot per second squared. Notice I ran all those together. I did that on purpose. That's because the unit of pound mass foot per second squared is a legitimate force dimension of its own. Just like an inch and a foot or a centimeter and a meter are valid units of their own, you see. And so... It's kind of like saying if I, you know, or, or money. Let's talk money, right? Everybody likes money. So a dollar 
versus a hundred pennies or a dollar versus ten dimes right these are the same amounts but you count them differently one dollar is equal to ten dimes right how can you say one equals ten well because it's different amounts of value right in the same way one pound force is a different quantity of force than one pound mass foot per second squared now notice in SI units one Newton is one kilogram meter per second squared there they match but in English it doesn't now you might say well that enough is that that alone is enough for me to hate English units and love SI well yeah but there's a wrinkle in SI too what if you wanted to calculate the amount of force exerted on a one Newton or excuse me on a one kilogram object well you would have to multiply that one kilogram by 9.81 meters per second squared to realize that earth is pulling on that one kilogram uh, object with a force of 9.81 newtons and that's kind of odd right because there they, they don't match right the the newton and the kilogram don't really match uh, as far as, as uh, acceleration on earth goes the neat thing about english units is that one pound mass will weigh one pound force as long as it's on earth now I could take that one pound mass to the moon it will not weigh one pound force anymore but it'll still be one pound mass worth of mass so students often get confused between pounds force and pounds mass these are two different units and they're measuring two different dimensions you can't just take one pound mass and convert it into one pound force that doesn't work right one pound mass will weigh one pound force if you set it on a scale on earth but it will not weigh one pound mass if you set it on the surface of the sun right it'll weigh a lot more because the sun's going to pull a lot harder on it so um anyway if you need a memory trick to remember this conversion factor formerly known as g sub c here it is you probably can all remember f equals ma right force equals mass times acceleration you've heard enough in your life it's probably committed to memory so the way you can write this down as long as you remember that a pound force goes with a dimension of force and a pound mass goes with a dimension of mass you can write force equals ma and for that force you can write one pound force and you can write equals and then in mass you can literally write, write one pound mass but you're not done yet okay because you can't just set force equal to mass and then multiply by the acceleration that you can re remember and probably all of you remember 32.2 feet per second squared so just tack that onto the end for the acceleration that you can easily remember and you've got it that is the conversion factor formerly known as g sub c it's the easiest memory trick i've uh, come up with for remembering how to convert between the unit of force that is a pound force and the unit of force that is a pound mass foot per second squared okay now a lot of students get confused because they don't like running the the mashing together the pound mass foot per second squared but you're okay with mashing together length and time to come up with acceleration right so why wouldn't you be okay adding mass in there 